Um, so he asked me to introduce everyone, which, which makes a certain amount of sense because I know all of these folks and I put this panel together and I am just delighted to have them all here. I'm incredibly honored and I just you know, could not be happier. I sort of as I was working on this book, I thought, we have this cool tradition of book celebrations at Cornell. Who can I have to come back for my book celebration? And I, and I got the perfect panel, so I'm, I'm really happy. So from starting on my left, you're right, I'll introduce everyone briefly, then I'll shut up and let them talk. Um, and then per the usual format, I'll say a few things in response and then open up to questions. So on my left is Michelle Moody Adams, who is, uh, I, I like to think of her as a Cornellian. She's still the Cornellian. She was for a long time. When I first came here, she was the director of the Ethics in Public Life program, which is a really a pioneering uh, practical and professional ethics program started by Henry Hsu, and she took it over when uh, when Henry left. And, and I had I had high hopes of, of being involved in this program and doing the the work that I do, which is a kind of the interface between theory and practice within her program. But then we uh, we lost her to Columbia. Uh, she went to the city, to the bright lights in the big city, uh, where she is now in the philosophy department and is a professor of political philosophy and legal theory. So she's uh, you know, working in, in very similar areas that I am at an institution that I also love. Um, but it proved not to be that difficult to lure her back to Ithaca. She, she likes it here and actually, in fact, said, boy, we got great weather today. So uh, she has to be a Cornelian if today's weather struck her as, as good weather. Uh, the, the next person to my right, your left, is uh, Greg Cooper, who is a professor of philosophy at Washington and Lee University, who was the director for a number of years of the Ethics in Public Life uh, program at WNL. And Greg and I go way back. In fact, when both of us were hired in our respective departments at Washington and Lee, we came to the, the new hired faculty reception and were standing around drinking beer and, and, and recognized one another as you know nice guys who like to drink a beer and, and got to talk talking and found out that we were both hired to teach legal ethics. Uh, me in the law school and, uh, and he on the undergraduate side. And he confessed that he's not a lawyer and hadn't taught legal ethics before. And I said, well, maybe we ought to team up and maybe we ought to do your class as a, as a co-taught class. And so for five years, we co-taught a philosophical legal ethics class in the undergraduate college with cross-enrollment with law students. And it's really no exaggeration to say that virtually every idea I've ever committed to paper that's worth anything came out of that teaching experience because we would sit down before class and prep and think about stuff and, and, uh, and then I just write notes frantically and say, ah, oh, this is a great idea. And a lot of things came out of it and also came out of the program he directed which involved bringing in keynote academic presenters from outside to come into a weekend long workshop series. So we got to know all the big wheels in the field and, and got to run our arguments by Bill Simon and David Lubon and Arthur Applebaum and Daniel Markovitz and people like that. So the course of that program was just invaluable to my own professional development and so it's just wonderful to have Greg here. The the third panelist, I think, holds a record now, and, and I don't think it'll ever be challenged seriously, of the person who came from the longest way away for a book celebration, uh, Tim Dare from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and all of you guys know that I'm phenomenally tedious about my love for New Zealand. Um, Tim is a part of the reason for that. He's just a, a fabulous guy, a professor of philosophy at uh, Auckland University, and someone I've gotten to know through a number of international legal ethics conferences over the years. And one of the interesting things that I discovered in addition to him being a really nice guy, is that he sort of independently worked out a lot of the positions that I was currently taking in my own scholarship and, and defending in a book that came out in 2010. Tim's book came out in 2009. Um, so we kind of proudly occupy... Uh, what are we calling it now? The third wave now? Fourth wave of uh, theoretical legal ethics scholarship. And coming from, you know, different parts of the world, different backgrounds, and, and arriving at the same place convinced us both that we just have to be right about this. Um, otherwise, what could the explanation be? So it's just uh, a real honor to have Tim schlep all the way from the Antipodes uh, to be part of this panel. So I will, um, the folks will present in the order that I've introduced them and uh, hopefully give you a sense for what this project is all about and, and some of their thoughts, and then I'll talk a little bit, and then we'll hear from you guys. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Never mind on the order. We, we can manage that. Um, so th thank you very much for the opportunity um, of coming. Justice uh, Brad is a, a New Zealand file. I turn out to be a kind of us file actually. I'm very fond of the U.S., um, something you, you don't, don't admit quietly in New Zealand or, or, or very loudly in New Zealand, but um, it's very nice. And we're going to talk about roles a bit and ask Brad's 
hinted, um, I have lots of roles with respect to Brad where co-authors or co-editors um, we're sort of protagonists in various academic debates, um, and also over the years we've become friends. So it's, it's very, very nice to be able to have an opportunity to come and talk about the book. Um, so Brad is one of the leading figures in what we can call the third wave in philosophical legal ethics. Um, the first wave in the sort of late 70s, early 80s, uh, consisted of work by the likes of Richard Vosserstrom, uh, David Lubin, um, version one, we'll come back to some of the later versions um, in a moment, Gerald Postema, um, and so on. And they were a group of philosophers and lawyers who began analysing professional ethical, ethical obligations from the perspective of philosophical ethics. And uh, so prior to that, uh, a lot of the work had been essentially the law of lawyering, and so it had been working out what the parameters of the law around professional ethics were, but this was really the first serious set of attempts to look at it from the point of view of philosophical ethics. And a theme in that work was a deep scepticism about the idea that you could defend a professional ethics which saw professional ethics as being distinct from ordinary morality or ordinary ethics. So the idea that there was something different about working out what a professional should do than there was about working out what any decent person trying to do the right thing was. And so um, that scepticism really flowed through that early, early work. Uh, the second wave, which included Bill Simon, uh, Steve Pepper, Arthur Applebaum, um, came around the late 90s, and a good deal of that work was, is usefully understood as a response and uh, elucidation of the first wave. And then the third wave, um, Brad, uh, Daniel Markovitz, David Luban, um, version two, um, we're sort of up to about version four now, um, uh, and, and maybe me, um, came in the first decades of the 2000s, and that third wave brought a much more explicit philosophical um, and jurisprudential grounding. So um, much, much more clearly saw legal ethics as a branch of applied ethics or jurisprudence. Now, Brad, of course, is uniquely well-placed, or almost uniquely well-placed to do that. He's a Jeremy Waldron student, and um, so he's, he's very well-placed to bring philosophical ethics and jurisprudence um, to bear on the topic. And um, um, that explains, of course, why this book, The, the um, Ethics and the Law, is a book in the Cambridge University Press Applied Ethics series. Um, so um, it is, I, I think it's the first general introduction to philosophical legal ethics. Um, there will be more, I'm sure, but they will be influenced by Brad's book, which is, which is a groundbreaking project, the first person to try and do this. So what about the book? So I'm a philosopher and a lawyer, and so of course I'm going to um, grumble and identify some criticisms, but I don't want any mistake, I wouldn't want this mistaken for thinking that I don't think this is a very worthwhile book. Um, it's a book I wish I'd written, um, you know, sort of high, high praise. Um, and I think Brad has made a very good fist of a difficult job. Now, one reason these jobs are difficult, writing books like this is difficult, is what I think of, the, of as the onion problem, and anyone who's taught uh, complex subjects from scratch will be familiar with this problem. You want the students or, or your readers at the end of the day to understand how the onion holds together, but of course you can't do it all at once, you've got to do it layer by layer, and you can't really understand any of the layers until you understand them all, so what you're doing is necessarily beginning with a kind of superficial treatment of some of the outside layers You've got to get the student started. You've got to get the reader started somewhere. Now, those of us who use introductory ethics texts um, in all sorts of areas, in medicine and business and so on, will be familiar with one not very satisfactory way of doing that, and that is the way which begins with a survey of uh, moral theories. You go through consequentialism. You go through deontology. You go through virtue ethics. Um, and then you write about the cases and it's completely mysterious what the two bits of the work have to do with one another. And so I could name names, but anyone who's looked at these texts will be familiar with this vice where you don't quite understand what does the first bit have to do with the second bit. Now, Brad avoids that vice, and he, so he's, he's aware of it, and he's very careful. So this book divides roughly into two parts. 
The first part, which I guess is about two-thirds of the book, something like that in terms of volume, is setting out the philosophical and legal uh, and, and jurisprudential theory, and the second part is looking at a series of cases. Um, um, Brad bridges them with a metaphor um, of a bridge, so bridges them with a, a bridge metaphor, where you've got ordinary morality at one end of the bridge and professional morality or professional ethics at the other end of the bridge. Now, on the one hand, then, I think that that's a good metaphor. It avoids this danger of having the two parts unseparated, but I think there's a problem with it, um, and the, the, the problem's going to be a cause, ironically, I think, in part because Brad is such a a decent and punctilious scholar and was so careful not to write an introductory text which was just a repeat of his own substantive contribution to the area. So Brad essentially leaves himself out of the, um, the story and leaving himself out of the story means that the bridge metaphor I think gets him into trouble. Um, now of course as Brad says he and I defend the same position so partly I'm worried that he leaves himself out that means he leaves me out too. Um, it happens that Brad and I are right, um, and so in leaving out that story, we get into a certain kind of difficulty. So what I want to do is just sketch Brad's own theory in, the, in his substantive contribution um, a little bit in, in very broad terms, and I'm going to do it without talking much about Brad since, since that's what he, he plainly wants from the book. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about this two-step model where you don't have a bridge which allows someone at the professional ethics end to just pop back and forth between professional ethics and ordinary ethics or professional morality and ordinary morality. You can't go back and forth across the bridge. Um, this is a view which thinks there's a two-step process. What happens is that we use ordinary morality to build institutions and practices like law and promise and contract and so on and so on. And once you're in the practice, your conduct is properly governed by the principles and rules of the practice. Now, the practice is built with respect to ordinary morality, but from within the practice, you can't appeal directly back to ordinary morality. Um, so, uh, David Luban, in the early version, um, describes this he, in a, a hilarious philosophical in joke. He calls this the fourfold root of sufficient reason. Um, and, you know, what's, what's funny about that is mainly that David thinks it's a joke. Um, and, and the, the way this works is that there are four steps. First step, you justify an institutional practice by appeal to ordinary morality. So you justify the law or health systems or promise just with full access to ordinary morality. Second step, you show that that practice requires certain roles. So the, the, the practice of law requires judges and lawyers um, and lawyers and all of their, their different roles that Brad describes so well. Third step, you show that those roles require certain kinds of professional obligations or permissions. So the role of the lawyer requires the obligation of confidentiality. In what sense does it require it? Well, without confidentiality, the idea goes, clients don't tell you things, and so the, the, the lawyer can't do the job. If the lawyer can't do the job, then you don't get the benefit of the role. And if they, you don't get the benefit of the role, then you don't get the benefit of the the morally justified institution. So this is a derivative justification. And finally, at step four, you show that that role obligation or permission requires a particular act in this case, not divulging confidentiality, for instance. Now, Luban thinks that you reason your way all the way through all four steps. So in every case, you go through all four steps, you, from the moral justification through the role, through the role obligation, to the justification of the role act, and then you ask, how does that balance against the demands of ordinary morality. Now that's the bridge metaphor, right? That's popping back and forth from all the way from one end to the other, albeit by these four steps that he's set out. Now there's a, um, uh, um, an alternative view, and I, I, it's certainly mine, and I think perhaps it's Brad, so though one interesting thing reading this book makes me wonder whether this is a difference between us, which says there's a line between steps two and three. Once you justify the, 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 the role obligations, that's all that the role occupant can appeal to. You can't appeal all the way back from the role to step one to the ordinary moral justification. Now, I'm perfectly happy that there, are, that there are other roles, so the lawyer can't appeal from the lawyer's role back to ordinary moral justification, but there's a, the role of the law reformer, which can be occupied by the lawyer, 
provider is not in conflict with their clients, which allows the law reformer to say, look, the, the rules of the practice or, or law allows me this, this victory, but that's a bit odd. We should tweak the practice. But the, the lawyer can't do that qua lawyer. The lawyer has to do that qua law reformer. So on this approach, there's no single bridge. There's no, um, it's a much more complicated story with, with more steps and less permeable roles. So once you're in the roles, you can't appeal out of them. So the idea is that there's no direct connection. Now in this book, Brad doesn't really run that theory. He talks about the idea of reflective equilibrium, where we reason from cases to general principles and seek coherence. He talks about a three-step process where you look at cases and you look at theory and you um, uh, look at principle and you get them into coherence. So again, in the book, he appears to defend this Luban-like view where you go where there is a bridge and you can wander back and forth it um, from the role or not. So I think that um, uh, leaving that, what I call the clean break story, the idea that the lawyer's roles or professional roles in general are impermeable, actually I should say I think this is about all roles actually, so I think our lives are made of roles and they're all a bit like this. Leaving out that impermeable um, uh, story gets them into trouble and, and so um, one example, I'll, I'll just give this example and then stop, he talks about criminal defence lawyers. Now, it's, it's very common in the legal ethics literature to think that criminal ethics, uh, so criminal defence lawyers are in a special case. They are allowed to do things which lawyers operating in contract or what have you are not. Um, and the story is that there's this great imbalance between the state, um, presumably you can do this in contract, there's an imbalance between the state or state-like institutions on the one hand and vulnerable individual defendants or, or, or individuals on the other. And so Luban thinks criminal defence lawyers can use tricks which would look bad in other areas because you've got this inequality and you need a way of balancing it. And Brad says, um, well, that sounds OK, but there's a problem it makes it sound like the law is a, is a game, um, like poker or what have you, where of course it's okay to bluff, it's one of the rules, and when you're bluffing at poker you don't need to worry about whether bluffing is in general morally justified, you're not doing that, you're bluffing within the game. Um, Brad says that can't be right, unlike in a game of poker, the law is not a straightforward game, there are people affected by the conduct who haven't consented to play, the stakes are much higher, and so on and so on. So we shouldn't accept this game metaphor to describe what's going on in law. Now, I don't mind that story um, in the criminal law. I'm not entirely happy about it, but I don't mind it too much. But notice that it leaves out questions such as, who can decide that this is a case in which you can appeal all the way back to ordinary morality? So who, who decides that this is a case in which bluffing, although allowed by the rules, is not al allowed. Or this is a case in which keeping confidentiality, although allowed or required by the rules, doesn't actually generate a genuine obligation because, after all, it's only a professional ethical obligation and not an obligation of ordinary morality. And so I'm worried about the idea that this story, the single bridge metaphor, makes the lawyer's role too permeable to the demands of ordinary morality and I think there are good moral reasons to hold on to this two-step process. So let, let, let me stop there. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here to celebrate, celebrate with you and with Brad the publication of this book. Um, as Brad pointed out, I've been teaching <clears throat> what has come to be known as philosophical legal ethics for, well, since about 2000 or so, so uh, for a long time. And as Tim pointed out, this is really the first actual textbook in that, in that field. Prior to that, you always had to piece together, you know, readings from, and, and it's very interdisciplinary, right? So. Um, you know, when Brad and I were teaching it, we had, you know, all sorts of books that, you know, you might not expect to find in a course like this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Law and Disagreement by Jeremy Waldron, uh, Innocence Lost by a philosopher named Christopher Gollins, uh, a little book on ethics by uh, Simon Blackburn, right? And, and uh, <clears throat> so 
It's really nice to have uh, a single volume that treats jurisprudential issues, ethical theory, political uh, morality, all in the same, all in the same volume. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm really happy to see the book come down the pike. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the course that Brad mentioned and, and, and about, I suppose it was his journey and my journey in, 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 in teaching this course. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the book. Um, and uh, um, like Tim, you know, a couple little gentle probes at, at, at the book, but overall I'm, I'm on board. <clears throat> so the course, as Brad mentioned, was uh, team taught and it involved law students and undergraduates. Um, Brad always had to give the disclaimer at the beginning that the course was not uh, going to help, help you with the model rules or the PR portion of the bar exam because that's not what the course was about. And so, um, so the law students uh, were warned of that. Um, and we started the course the first it, very much uh, in I think the grips of what Tim was calling the first wave, right? The, the first wave in, in, in philosophical legal ethics was very critical of the idea that a professional role would mint a moral permission to violate or mint a permission to violate ordinary morality, right? It was very much in the grips of the idea that you know if, if you couldn't square the obligations the role obligations of the profession with ordinary moral obligations, then something was screwed up with your analysis of the role obligations of, of the profession. And um, the first, you know, so each of these courses had, uh, had a component near the end. We called it an ethics institute. And for the ethics institute, we would invite a visiting scholar. And this was almost invariably someone whose work we read during the course of the course. And we would invite uh, a, a bunch of practitioners. These were very sharp lawyers, uh, mostly lawyers, some judges. And we would ask each of them to bring an ethics case from their professional lives. And they would write up this ethics case. And then we would, together with the visiting scholar, we would spend uh, a couple days in, in, in roundtable discussion of these cases. Uh, sometimes the students would present cases as well if, if in, you know, it depended on how many professionals we had. So the first year, uh, our visiting scholar in the book that we read was Bill Simon. The book, Practice of Justice, had just come out uh, maybe a couple years before that. So the students read it, and we, you know, went through it in great detail. And <clears throat> then we had the Institute, and it was a train wreck, basically. Uh, Simon was saying things that you ought to do as a lawyer and the, and the practitioners couldn't even recognize their profession in what he was saying, right? He was, he was a lawyer needs to think like a judge and all, all these, you know, he was, it was very much against the sort of adversarial, uh, adversarialism that the practitioners saw as, as the hallmark of, of, of their profession. And it was, it was interesting. Um, Bill, Bill did not, uh, he did, he, I thought sparks were going to fly, but Bill didn't really engage all that much. And we had one student who valiantly tried to defend Simon to the practitioners, and she was pretty much hung out or thrown under the bus. Maybe that's the that's the right term. <laughs> Anyhow, it was really interesting, and and we had a series of these institutes. You know, uh, David Lubon was was a visitor. Uh, Arthur Applebaum was a visitor, and each of these visitors was. Someone that was, uh, in, in some sense, uh, representative of Tim's first wave of, of, of this view that, you know, that, that the profession doesn't mint these permissions to violate ordinary morality. Uh, and, and in each case, there was just this dramatic uh, incongruence between the academic views and the views of the practitioners. It was, it was really interesting. And um, I think it's fair to say that for both of us, uh, each one of these episodes sort of eroded our commitment <laughs> to the first wave a little bit. And, and you know, uh, the, uh, Brad's book and the literature in general talks about the standard conception of legal ethics. Well, the standard conception is this view that, you know, that it really is an adversarial profession and, and it really does mint permissions to violate ordinary morality, right? It's, a, it's you know, this idea that the lawyer's obligation is to, you know, uh, 
zealously pursue the client's interests to the bounds of the law. That's the, the sort of motto of the standard conception. And I think it's fair to say that that conception got a little bit rehabilitated each sort of iteration of these institutes. And, and uh, just a quick example of that rehabilitation, one of the people that we had, uh, maybe third or fourth year, was a guy named Stephen Lubet, who uh, wrote a book called Nothing But the Truth. I forget the subtitle. Uh, but it was something like uh, how lawyers are obligated to tell the truth, only the truth, but not the whole truth. Right? And, and so <clears throat> we were all sort of gunned up and ready for Lubet when we, we'd gone through his book in class. And, and, and what he was saying is, you know, lawyers are liars, and, and you know, and there's just no way around it. And, <clears throat> well, he showed up, and he's a, he's a very good, I think he teaches trial law tactics, and he's very good at it. And uh, he blew through every roadblock we had set up. I mean, it was, it was n n no, you know, pinning anything on him. But the interesting thing is, if you look at Brad's book, the new book, um, there is a complete sort of Stephen Lubet line in there about lawyers and storytelling that uh, at, back in the day we would have sort of been shocked to hear come out of either one of our mouths, but now, <laughs> but now it, here it is in, in, in the book. So, um, so that's, you know, and, and if you want, uh, uh, you know, as Tim pointed out, Brad, um, was very careful not to uh, re put too much of his own view in this book, perhaps too careful. <clears throat> but if you want to see uh, you know, the real journey, look at his other book. But let me talk now about this book. Um, a couple things, several things that I think I already mentioned, uh, you know, interdisciplinarity and the importance of having, uh, of being able to incorporate political philosophy and jurisprudence in particular in a course on philosophical legal ethics. And one of the things that this book does a really nice job of is it, it does that, right? It incorporates these ideas. Um, it also, I think, does a really valuable job in recognizing uh, different legal roles, right? So a lot of the uh, early discussion in philosophical legal ethics was really about lawyers in the context of litigation, or at least under the shadow of litigation. And that's one important role, but it's, it, it's, it's it, you know, it's just one role, and in, and in fact not even a dominant role. And, and uh, the normative contours of the profession are very different in other contexts, in the counseling context, for example. And, and um, so this book does a really nice job of sorting that out and, and, uh, and recognizing that, um, you know, that it's not just about litigation. And, you know, uh, another thing that it does, I think, a nice job of is, is recognizing that clients are something beyond uh, sort of bundles of legal interests, right? The, the sort of, in the, in the uh, Kate Cruzy talks about, you know, they're not cardboard clients, right? They're, they're people with their own sort of moral agendas and other agendas, and, and that needs, and that sometimes is, 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 is not uh, recognized. And I think the book does a nice job of that. Um, the, the little quibbles that I have, um, again, they, they ha some of them have to do with um, the fact that Brad was, I think, being overly careful not to, uh, not to make this book a brief for his own, his own uh, position. Um, if you look at the, there's a chapter on counseling, for example, and in that chapter on counseling, he, he presents the, 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 the debate as between uh, somebody like Stephen Pepper, who, who is really concerned to uh, enhance the autonomy of clients, to provide for them what he calls first class citizenship, to not be uh, paternalistic, and so he talks about the need for the lawyer to adopt an amoral role, to not make moral judgments when they're acting. Uh, you know, in their professional role. And on the other side, uh, Anthony Cronman, uh, who talks about the lawyer statesman and, and views the professional role as one that involves harmonizing the client's interest with the public interest, right? And so he, you know, the, the counseling chapter is about this, about this debate back and forth. In my view, there's a, there's a third position that is actually a better position than either one of those, and that is Brad's position and it's Tim's position, and that is the position that the that the lawyer <coughs> ought to secure the client's legal entitlements. Right? I mean that 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 should be the touchstone, the normative touchstone for the counseling relationship. You know, what is it that you know the client is legally entitled to achieve? 
And it doesn't, it isn't there, partly because I think Brad doesn't want to, you know, well, it just should have been there, anyhow. Sorry, Brad. Um, the other point that I would make just quickly is, um, you know, we've got this bridge metaphor, and on the one side is ordinary morality, on the other side is professional ethics, and there's been a lot of discussion. We've had a lot of discussion over this morning and yesterday and over beers and about traffic over the bridge. What's the, what's the deal on the traffic over the bridge? <clears throat> and Tim wants... Tim wants you to uh, schlep a bunch of stuff from ordinary morality across the bridge and then build the institution and then blow up the bridge, right, basically. So that, you know, when you're, you know, acting in role in the institution, then it's, it's the institution that determines your role out, your obligations and not ordinary, ordinary morality. The people that I mentioned in the first wave, of course, would like to see lots of traffic back and forth across the bridge, right? You, you're always sort of wandering back across to, to uh, uh, you know, to consult ordinary morality and um, and there's a kind of trade-off, right? Uh, if you think about two sort of goals of the profession, one might be, you know, a, a kind of goal of zealous advocacy, a goal of, of securing the client's legal entitlements or if, if you, you know, uh, if you're um, a little bit more in the standard conception, maybe you go beyond legal entitlements to, to things that uh, the law could be made to yield. In any case, <clears throat> there's that goal, and then the other goal is is a kind of integrity goal. That is, you know, can you can the lawyer practice, you know, with in, in such a way that they can still recognize that they are. It's the it's the can a good lawyer be a good person question. Um, the more traffic there is across the bridge, the easier that second problem is to handle. Uh, but it, the less uh, zealous the advocacy is going to be. The less traffic across the bridge, the more zealous the advocacy, but the greater the threat, I think, to integrity. Um, and the last point that I, I would make is just that uh, um, there's another way in which the bridge metaphor works. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you really have to wander back across the bridge, right? I mean, when you, when you punch out, uh, you go back across the bridge and join the world of ordinary morality. And so, um, so we can't blow up the bridge. Uh, but one of the things that happens is if you've had to do things while you're engaged in your professional activities that are at odds with your ordinary moral activities, then, uh, then you encounter what uh, Christopher Gowans calls moral remainders. And I think that um, that's another part that Brad does a nice job of with in his other book and I think could have been in this book as well. But overall, it's great to have finally a text for philosophical legal ethics. Thank you. I too want to say what a pleasure it is to be here today, um, both to discuss uh, Brad's work with fellow panelists as well as with you, but also especially to celebrate the work that Brad is doing and trying to bring together our subtle, finely textured appreciation of what lawyers actually do with a sense that there, is, there are philosophical problems um, both in the realm of ethics but also in thinking about the nature of law um, and what legal systems ought to be doing and, and why they ought to be doing it. And I just I think it's a wonderful book in many regards for, for bringing those things together. Um, I've taught several versions of A Course in Philosophy of Law for many years, and I have to say that I started out not thinking that there was any reason to talk about the ethics of lawyers, even though I thought they were important. I didn't see how it could be properly integrated into A Course in the Philosophy of Law. And now, um, perhaps especially after, after reading Brad's book, um, now I can't imagine doing it, uh, A Course in Philosophy of Law, without it. I tend to use a textbook that has sort of small selections on lawyers in the adversary system. But one of the real uh, special virtues of this book is a reminder that the, uh, we have to always attend to the complexity of the roles that, that lawyers can play. And I think this book is really wonderful for the way in which it nicely um, 
sort of articulates the, vi the quite varied functions that, that lawyers can play. Um, you know, it's one thing to try to put the criminal defense lawyer very much at the center of at least the popular conception of, of the law, but the, the civil litigator is doing something very different. The prosecutor is doing something very different. The person who works uh, as a corporate um, lawyer and is counseling corporate clients who um, you know, have interests that are not always the same as the public interest is doing something very different. Uh, on this issue of the complexity of the, of the, the roles, I think students will really benefit, as students who are either thinking about the law or at least thinking about engaging with it as, as philosophers, to understand just how complex each one of these roles is. I think especially the role of the prosecutor in this moment in our culture in which as a function of some of the sadder features of our, of our criminal justice system um, in which um, the grand jury system has come under a certain kind of scrutiny and we've come to look at the role of the prosecutor as something we're mostly critical of, to remember just how hard it is to be a prosecutor um, and to understand the many different constituencies that the prosecutor is asked to take into account, which I think Brad is really wonderful in doing this. I found myself thinking while I was reading this that a prosecutor is the, the legal equivalent of a department chair <laughs> where everybody wants everything. Um, the prosecutor really doesn't have you know, complete authority to make the decisions. There is a chain of command. And trying to think about the ethical dimensions of such a role um, in a way that doesn't just reduce it to why didn't this outcome of this grand jury case work the way it did or why um, isn't this defendant actually going to end up standing trial. I think the, the subtlety and the richness of the portrayals of each of the, the forms of, of legal activity that come in here really, even if nothing else about the book were valuable, which of course is not true, um, I would think it had performed a wonderful service. Um, I would also add that I was um, grateful as a philosopher, not trained as a lawyer, but who thinks a lot about, about the law and the activity of lawyers, um, to be pushed to think that a model of um, legal practice that I had kind of taken for granted as the right one, and that's Kronman's model, has its drawbacks uh, in, in many regards. The kind of lawyer statesman model who's supposed to always have a bit of an eye on, on the public interest. Um, maybe there is a sense in which we're asking uh, the wrong things of the ordinary lawyer um, who has a certain set of professional demands. Um, and maybe competent advice is a perfectly good um, thing for a lawyer to be, to be delivering. I still think there is a role. Uh, for the um, lawyer statesman. I don't even think that the notion of a statesman has to be construed in a way that means you have to have held office, but you have to see yourself as a lawyer, as a, a, a having a privileged role in society. So I think there can be a good grounds for that Cronman model. But this book does a wonderful job of reminding us of some of the shortcomings and some of the excessive demands we would be making on lawyers uh, uh, to hold them to that standard. But I actually want to go most importantly to the issue of the relationship between law and morality. Because we had a wonderful conversation this morning about this bridge metaphor, and you've, both speakers before me have talked about it. And over the um, time of reading the book, I found myself wondering if Brad really wants to be committed to the bridge metaphor, the sense of something you, you cross over into another world once you become a professional lawyer and you hope that the background shaping of the institutions in which you practice is informed by uh, moral values in the right way. But then your job is mostly to try and secure all the things that your client is legally entitled to. And I'm not sure that Brad actually believes that. Um, some of the time, and I, I, I ask him to comment on this, it looks more as though it's a kind of Venn diagram with a very large circle on one side, which is ordinary morality, and a somewhat smaller, maybe several different circles for different professions, but certainly one small circle uh, for the legal profession, with a very large uh, space of overlap between the ethical requirements that are incumbent upon lawyers and the moral requirements that are incumbent upon us as ordinary people. Why do I say that? Even thinking about the whole notion of reflective equilibrium as a model for uh, decision-making in a given case, 
Um, Brad talks about the first stage of specifying a value that's at stake in a particular um, legal issue, and then thinking about what principles of ethical responsibility, um, uh, ethical duty and prerogative might be relevant, and then looking at how the principles once set out that way have a certain outcome in the cases. Do they match the judgment we want to have in a particular case? The specifying of the value, what, what, whether it's the, a deontological value like dignity or autonomy, whether it's a right to be pr protected against this awful you know, state that tends to perhaps sometimes interfere wrongly and unfairly in the lives of, of little people, whether it's criminal defendants or in some other way. And specifying of the value is something that I think shows that the um, there's an interpenetration that's unavoidable and that you can't let go of if you're actually doing the work of the practicing lawyer properly. Um, and I don't think it's enough to say that, well, you're just grabbing onto a value that's out there, because sometimes you have to figure out not only which value is relevant, but if there is a plurality of values and there's some possible conflict between them, so the dignity of and the right of your client, say, to have his or her story told, and the right of the person who is possibly a victim of something your client did, I said possibly, then you have to figure out how to weigh the value of protecting the well-being of that, um, that person who might have been affected by your client against the values of um, serving your client's right to have what he or she is legally entitled to realized. Um, and, and I think that, for my mind, there are other places in the book, including where um, we're thinking about um, people in a legal aid setting who are working with clients who are um, severely disadvantaged and maybe the law seems in some way to be set up to work against them and the lawyer has to make the decision whether in a particular case to try and stretch the boundaries of the law in a way to minister to some interest or some right that he or she thinks the client has. What makes that kind of reflection possible for me suggests an un understanding that the range of things that constitute your duty uh, and even your prerogative as a lawyer continues, even as you've become a, a professional, to be, and I think rightly shaped by um, concern about um, and conformity with values that may be larger than the uh, values that are just part of the profession. So I'll just throw that out there as something that I would um, like Brad to think about. and. Then I wanted to make a second big point, which I think um, is also evidence of a kind of tension in the book, but a, a constructive um, and sometimes provocative tension. So there's a question about the relationship between morality and the law, but there's also a question about the relationship between jurisprudential thinking and legal practice. And that's at, at, uh, at issue in a lot of the first two-thirds of the book. Um, that um, the other two commentators noted sort of that's a lot of heavy weight gets gets carried out in that section before all the complex concrete details come and I, I guess I want to say i don 't know if i 've become too much of a Dworkinian in this, but there is a sense in which for even the simplest kinds of cases in some instances, the question of what law is and what it ought to be as much as the question of you know, what moral values it ought to embody, I think can be implicit in the, pra the practice of sometimes the simplest kinds of cases. You know, a criminal defense, um, a, a, sorry, a, a client who comes to you seeking your uh, services as a criminal defender may strike you as somebody who is where he or she is um, for reasons that um, are partly a function of how the legal system has defined rights and duties and created a realm of possibility and opportunity uh, within which some people can lead very rich and flourishing lives and some people cannot. And so you might find yourself wondering whether, um, the, you know, so this debate about whether juries should engage in nullification, I think that's Paul Butler, you know, is this the kind of place where you're going to push your argument about um, what the law ought to be? Um, uh, and the decision not to do it in a particular instance seems to me to be a decision where at that point of initially specifying 
governing values. Some are going to be moral and some are going to be legal. I want to suggest that the practice of the law, even of the most ordinary kind or apparently ordinary, may be so fundamentally shaped by a need to make some kind of decision about these larger issues. Um, I think Brad wants to resist that in some parts of the book, but the, the um, wonderful detail and care with which he articulates the worries about jurisprudence, the nature of law and so forth, make me think that he does think it matters. I want to say it may matter more in the ordinary everyday case than your concluding portions of the book actually suggest. But I want to say on balance overall, I am so thrilled to have a book like this available uh, for people who teach um, philosophical ethics, who teach philosophy of law, who want to train their students, even those who aren't going to be on, go on to be lawyers, to understand more fully the challenges of the legal profession um, and the challenges of being engaged in that profession and also trying to be a human being who wants to be able to look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. Brett, thank you so much for this. Thanks, y'all. That was really that was really cool, and I, I really appreciate it. And not just because you said nice things, um, although that's always nice. Um, but actually, you know, as I was sitting here scribbling notes to respond, I, I realized you know, I don't have to go commentary commentator by commentator because I think the, the the comments coalesced around a few common themes. This came out this morning at Stella's. I kind of wish we had just been able to bring that table here and some coffee and, and just let y'all listen to us because I thought we had incredibly productive conversations then. And it, it's, it's really clear that, that the problems, the interesting problems in philosophical legal ethics are around a cluster of issues that I think we all agree are important. We're just not quite sure how to work them out. Um, so I'll start with one thing, and that's the cover of the book. I hate the cover of the book. I really do. I went round and round with the publisher. Uh, it had been kicked from the editorial to the design department by the time the cover got decided upon. And they, they were all about the, the symmetry and the balance and the lines. And I said, yeah, but this, this guy on the cover is so smarmy. You know, you just see him and it's just off-putting. Um, but then everyone else, all the commentators had their own interpretation of the cover. It was like a Rorschach blot. It was fantastic. Um, and, and, and Tim's partner, Justine, also a friend of mine, um, had an interpretation of these two lawyers here as being kind of robotic, something out of, you know, iRobot or something. And this smarmy guy adjusting his tie was actually looking at the, at the camera and looking at you and engaging with you. And, and the, you know, the serious point about that is that I think the central issue we're all worried about is moral agency or integrity. I think those are similar issues. And all of us, one way or another, are struggling with what is the right relationship between the moral agency of an occupant of a role, and it can be a lawyer or another professional or any other social role. Tim has a view, which I don't disagree with, which is that roles are pervasive in moral life. And one is different with one's partner and children and students and friends and clients and adversaries. And all of these different human relationships are structured by social roles, each of which are conventional to some extent, but also are informed by critical morality, and which provide a fairly finely grained set of duties that are adapted to different situations. And, and one of the, one of the problem, one of the things that constitutes being a competent moral agent is understanding how to work within all of these different roles. But of course the question then becomes how are these roles integrated into one life? And, and the, the, the integrity problem or the integrity story is, is giving a narrative account of oneself that encompasses all of these roles which is also unified. And the, the bridge, boy did we overwork the bridge metaphor, um, we talked about variations on it involving gates, uh, there were also trolls at one point that would jump up and stop things coming across the bridge. Um, so you know, who knows where this thing will end up. And I, I invite teachers, whoever, to adopt the book to, to draw trolls on the bridge. That's fine. Um, but the idea with, with the bridge is meant to convey some essential connection, a requirement of some connection between whatever are the obligations of role. And I, and I do more or less accept Tim's two-step Rawls-inspired structure, which is that you give a moral account of why a practice or an institution is justified. And then once one is within the practice, the, the, the rules of conduct 
valuation is given in terms of that practice, and there's not constant recourse back to the underlying moral values. I, I more or less agree with that, but I don't want to blow up the bridge. Um, or if I do blow up the bridge, I want to know how do we connect the professional role with moral agency or integrity? Um, because that's really the fundamental organizing problem uh, of philosophical legal ethics. How do we, how do we stay connected? Now, the, the first wave, folks, that, that Greg and Tim both mentioned, David Lubon, David, uh, Richard Wasserstrom, Jerry Postema, wanted there to be a lot of traffic back and forth across the bridge. Um, and one of the problems, and, and Greg really dramatized this nicely with the institute structure that we had at Washington and Lee, one of the problems is it's awfully difficult to give, a, to give an account of why lawyers do what they do if you constantly have this traffic back and forth across the bridge. Because it isn't too difficult to show that something that a lawyer believes is justifiably an obligation of her role also constitutes a violation of ordinary morality. It's, in ordinary moral terms, cheating or lying or humiliation or abuse or something like that. And lawyers want to deny that. They go, no, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not abuse, it's not cheating, it's, it's I'm being a zealous advocate, I'm following the rules. And the philosophers say, yeah, but there's a step missing in the argument. You have to explain how being in this role constitutes a justification as against some moral demand. And so the philosophers say, you've got to have the bridge. You know, the bridge is this insistence that there always be some kind of connection, and at the very least you can't blow it up. But as Greg's description really reveals, the practitioners who we dealt with, who are without exception decent, morally sensitive folks, thought the academics were from Mars. You know, they just couldn't understand what the philosophical critique was all about. They said, well, hang on a second. I, I take it that I'm taking part in a basically morally justified institution doing basically good things for society, and you're telling me that I lack justification? You're telling me that this role doesn't somehow mint a moral permission? What's going on here? So my approach to this field has been to go from the other direction, and I guess this is what constitutes the third wave and not the first wave. So rather than starting with, with ethical considerations like deontology or virtue, and then using it as a critical standpoint to evaluate professional practices, what I try to do, and I think reflective equilibrium is another way of representing this, what I try to do is, is take professional practices as given and then see whether it's possible to give a philosophically satisfying account of them. See whether there's any way we can explain and justify ourselves as lawyers to the critics, to the moral critics. And you know, that is, in a sense, being on the professional morality side of the bridge and saying what we're doing over here makes sense, but it's still connected somehow to the domain of ordinary morality. We haven't blown up the bridge. We haven't, we, we changed it also to a boat metaphor. We haven't cast the boat off from the dock and gone off sailing into the sea. Um, and some things Michelle uh, mentioned raise several possibilities for how this connection can be maintained between ordinary morality and professional ethics, while nevertheless recognizing professional ethics as distinctive. And, and she raised a couple of possibilities, and I thought of a few more. And I think all of these are in the book in some way, but maybe not very well developed. Um, one of them is to, in the constituting of the role, in the, the, the Rawlsian first step of, of coming up with the, the practice itself, it may be possible to build in to the regulative rules of the role, permissions to incorporate ordinary morality. So we see this clearly in the very interesting, I think, uh, example of prosecutors, where the prosecutor's role very explicitly directs the prosecutor to rely on conceptions of the public interest in deciding, deciding what to do. Now, I see friends of mine who are criminal defense lawyers in the audience sneering at prosecutors, and, and I understand this, this power may be abused, but at least in theory, the role itself and its specific role obligations build in a permission in fact, even maybe a duty to incorporate ordinary morality. So it may be that, that despite being on one side of the bridge, maybe it's not a bridge, maybe it's a telephone line or something, going to the land of ordinary morality and allowing incorporation of ordinary moral considerations into what is a professional practice, which is governed by recognizably distinct professional norms. That, that's one possibility for maintaining this connection. 
Another, and I talked about this more in my, my other book, Lawyers and Fidelity to Law, um, but I talk about it here too, is to maintain some kind of opt-out rights on an analogy with civil disobedience or conscientious objection, which allow lawyers to, to opt out of the professional role and act directly on the basis of ordinary moral considerations. So this is you know, a lot of two-way traffic back and forth across the bridge. Um, we would hope that lawyers aren't opting out with any frequency, um, but in a case of serious moral wrongdoing, it should be possible to have recourse to the ordinary moral values underpinning the institution. Um, now, again, along the, anal along the lines of civil disobedience or conscientious objection. This may have to be open. Uh, this may have to be accompanied uh, by a willingness to accept punishment, uh, something to, to legitimate the, the role itself while nevertheless opting out of the role. But this is one avenue for preserving one's professional integrity. And the third possibility was, uh, was suggested at Stella's by Michelle and, and then alluded to here. I thought she just did a fabulous job at Stella's of defending this. Um, and that is to problematize the, the, the role itself and deny what I want to affirm, which is that there is a distinction between professional values and ordinary morality in the following way. So the position that I defend and, and that Tim defends as well is that the role of the legal system and the lawyer generally are constituted by the need of a society for some kind of framework of cooperation and agreement, notwithstanding what we take to be pluralism about values and, and deep and persistent disagreement about normative and empirical matters. So we can all recognize this. We, we, we disagree uh, profoundly about a number of evaluative issues, but we nonetheless recognize that we have to avoid killing each other, and we also have to be able to cooperate and work together on mutually beneficial projects. And so we see that there is something valuable about an institution that would create what Joseph Raz calls exclusionary reasons for action, what would create reasons that we can all act upon, notwithstanding the fact that we disagree about other stuff. Scott Shapiro has recently written about this too in his theory of law, where he analogizes law to plans. You know, we're all kind of at odds about what to do. We don't know what we're going to do today. Let's make a plan, right? Let's figure out what we're going to do. And then the plan stands in for the reasons that we had prior to the plan. Law works in a similar way. It stands in for the things that we disagree about out and it allows us to cooperate. Well, if that's to work, then there has to be an institution of professional advisors and advocates that allow clients to understand what rights have been allocated to them by the law, what I call their legal entitlements, and who are permitted to counsel clients about what those are and to advocate for them if someone wants to interfere with them in some way. And that's what I take to be the moral foundation of the lawyer's role, this, this service or agency relationship with respect to clients, but it's kind of a bilateral agency. It's with, re with respect to clients, but also with reference to the rights and duties that have been allocated to them by the law. So as long as lawyers are acting within the law to help their clients in realizing their genuine legal entitlements, they aren't abusing this in any way, they're morally justified. Well, Michelle comes along and says, whoa, 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 hang on. This picture is way too neat, way too pat. You assume that it's possible to determine without recourse to the moral reasons we disagreed about that it's possible to determine what rights and duties have been allocated to citizens by the law so that lawyers can comfortably stay on one side of this thing and say, I'm only helping clients achieve their entitlements. Um, I don't have to worry about ordinary morality. Michelle says, blah, 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 blah. But if the law is more complicated than this, and she mentions Dworkin, um, but if ascertaining what the content of law is necessarily requires engagement with what the law ought to be, then lawyers can never bootstrap themselves out of ordinary morality by purporting to advise only within the bounds of the law. And so here you have a very tight connection. The bridge kind of collapses, but it collapses, interestingly enough, not at the level of kind of ethics, but at the level of jurisprudence. And so I just want to end by acknowledging something very important that Michelle said, and I hope I can keep doing more work in this area that's more in my own voice and not just as a textbook. And that is, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that what came out of the book is a sense that in order to attend to what lawyers ought to do, one ought to attend to jurisprudence. And conversely, when doing jurisprudence, one necessarily has to engage with the legal profession as an institution. I think these two disciplines have existed in just vast isolation from one another. Um, you know, I'm familiar with the jurisprudence literature. I write in the legal ethics literature, and there's just very little overlap. You know, I'm, I've got one foot in both lands. I am the bridge. Um, but 
there doesn't appear to be much bridging going on. And one of the things that I've tried to do in my work is to bring these two things closer together and to say, if you care about the philosophy of law, you're going to be asking questions about lawyers and what lawyers are allowed to do and permitted to do. And if you care about lawyers, you can't avoid engaging with the nature of law. You have to talk about Hart and Fuller and Dworkin and Finnis and all this good stuff, because otherwise you're begging all sorts of interesting questions. When you say that what, client, what lawyers can do is obtain their clients' legal entitlements or zealous advocacy within the back of the law, as lawyers like to say, there's always this question, okay, what is the law? Uh, how do we know? And what is the relationship between law and morality? That's just the classic question of jurisprudence, right? Hart Fuller debate and everything else. You've got to incorporate that into legal ethics. And so I'm glad that's coming through. I'm glad commentators are picking up on that. And I hope that kind of points toward a, you know, a, a map for future research, even though this really is intended as a, as a teaching tool and not really as a, a contribution to a debate. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming, um, and your comments are incredibly helpful. This is going to you know, become part of a, of a longer-term project that I'm working on, so I really appreciate it. Thanks again to the panelists um, for their contributions. I really, really appreciate it.